Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure to be screening the 1995 Academy Award winning film, Dersur Urzala, directed by one of the greatest directors in the history of cinema, Akira Kurosawa. This is what you might call an ecological epic. It tells the story of the friendship between a Russian captain and a hunter in the forest, a member of the Goldie people. This is set at the turn of the century and based on an actual set of memoirs. It's also a visually magnificent film, as we find in all of the work of Kurosawa. Joining us today to discuss this film will be one of the leading film scholars of the United States, Professor Annette Michelson from New York University. Now, take this opportunity to be truly awed by Dersu Urzala. Welcome back. Dersu, what an eloquent ending to this, uh, to this film. Uh, there's so much to talk about, uh, about this magnificent work. And today, we're very, very lucky to have a world-class expert on Akira Kurosawa with us. Returning to City Cinematheque is Professor Annette Michelson. Uh, many of our viewers know her from her writings, whether it be about Eisenstein Vertov or about her seminal role in American cultural life as one of the founders and editors of October uh, magazine. Welcome back to City Cinematheque, Annette. Thank you, Jerry. Let's start, Annette, with um, uh, a big question, because a lot of your scholarship has actually had to do with uh, suggesting that the film for the 20th century is such a key art that, like all other arts, is going to develop a canon of the most distinguished artists who've shown us what the medium really is and can, uh, can do. Kurosawa is a legendary uh, character, but it's worth you know, uh, talking a bit about why is he such a key figure in the development of, of cinema and such an influential uh, filmmaker? Well, one could say that he's one of the inventors of the modern Japanese cinema and that his work from the very beginning, but particularly from the immediately post-war period, uh, becomes canonical for a number of reasons. One is that he is, of course, the inheritor of a great tradition of visual arts in, J in Japan, and perhaps somewhat more concerned than a number of other Japanese filmmakers with perpetuating that, with, with uh, in a sense, uh, making, it, it, making it enter into modern cinema. The other thing is that he's an extraordinary film writer and script writer with a propensity for uh, adaptations of canonical texts. Um, one of those, for example, is The Idiot of Dostoevsky. Right. Um, another is, in fact, Desu Usala, which is a canonical text of a very particular kind in Russia. And we'll talk about that perhaps Great. a bit later. Um, Third, I think, is that there's a certain kind of mixture of cl extreme clarity in Kurosawa's work, a kind of clarity which often favors um, effects of symmetry and um, also a very, very effective use of uh, shot counter shots. Um, and he's such an extraordinary technician that um, he really knows how to pull the audience along with a very, very strong narrative style that is photographed under his very, very close surveillance magnificently. Okay, that, that makes me want to see, or more accurately, uh, rescreen you know, almost everything um, of his. Let's, uh, let's just move on uh, to this particular uh, work and the, uh, the book from which it's, it's derived. Um, What's the book? I think it is available in English uh, these days. Uh, but what's, what's its genre and uh, what is it? Well, Des Suicola is in many respects a true story to begin with. Uh, by the way, I don't know if it's available these days because the only version, the only English translation that I ever found of it when I began to read it quite some years ago was published 
in English by a Moscow press. Okay. But it is, it is almost compelled reading for Russian school children and in a number of those countries uh, which we used to call the satellite countries right. of the Soviet Union. Um, a Polish friend of mine, for example, read it in public school. Um, so it's the narrative by a man named Arsenyev, Vladimir Arsenyev, of the time spent way at the beginning of the century, at 99 years ago, in fact, beginning in uh, 1902, in the far east of Russia, the far eastern tip, that tip which was at that time very little explored, very little um, exploited. It was inhabited by people of a very particular and not too well-known culture with their own language, uh, by several of them, in fact. And Arsenyev, uh, who is a military man and a surveyor, is sent out to survey this part of the land. And he takes with him, of course, uh, a number of soldiers and a technician and just about enough equipment to see them through right. uh, this particular task. And the task takes, is really involved in the, the measurement and uh, the, the surveying of the most thickly dense forest land in the entire continent. It is known as the taiga. Okay. And uh, what we see, of course, is that they really must make their way uh, by clearing away brush, by fording difficult streams, uh, by all the kinds of um, skills and, 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 and with all the intensity of effort that exploration in, let us say, the jungle exactly. uh, would have involved. Okay, so uh, how did, uh, you know, this, is, this film is part of a Japanese film series highlighting a number of magnificent works from the canon of Japanese cinema, so we end up showing a work uh, that's largely in Russian, a little Chinese, um, and the Goldie, and the Goldie uh, language. So how did it come about that Kurosawa was making this film? And, and how do we, where do we put this film in his overall set of works? Well, it's a very interesting kind of adventure, in a sense, for Kurosawa. And it seems to me that it certainly has its place in Kurosawa's trajectory, and uh, it's certainly one of his last really great works. But it also has a place in Russian film, right. or in Soviet film, which this was at the time. Absolutely. Um, because it's a film of the 1970s. And I think that one has to see it as the extraordinary way in which perhaps the most beautiful film ever made of the Russian landscape was made by a Japanese. Mm. And the sense of that landscape, which one gets, of course, on the proper wide screen on which it should be projected, Absolutely. is uh, extraordinary, unforgettable, in fact. So that not only uh, the landscape, the scenery, but the, because of Kurosawa's uh, absolutely masterly editing skill, the way in which shots come both as logical and as surprises um, from one scene to another, one sequence to another. Okay, that's, uh, n n let me talk about a, a, a charge that I don't believe, and I know you don't um, uh, believe, uh, uh, about this film, and uh, I'm sure uh, you will refute it, and I'll, uh, I have my own refutation, but I think it's, it's something that um, you will be uh, interested in. And that is that this is a simple and sentimental tale that, um, you know, uh, let me make the charge, because it's been made by some critics. I don't agree with it. Uh, that, you know, that there's, there's this very nice 
old man and that's just what he is and this really um, in a certain kind of way gives a simplified portrait of these things. Now I don't think that's what the film is but that's what some people have charged. So how does Kurosawa secure for us the fact that that's not what the film is, even if some people have mistaken it. I think that. the first thing I would say in answer to your question is that when the book was written, um, the, it was, of course, uh, almost immediately um, a kind of product of prestige, uh, if not a bestseller, it later became a bestseller, and a number of the uh, kind of supreme masters of Ru Russian literature of the period uh, felt that Arsenyev was their Fenimore Cooper. Okay. And um, I think it was Gorky, if I'm not mistaken, who said at the time that um, essentially, you know, we, we know uh, more about the American Indians than we do about our own Far Eastern peoples. And you are telling us who they are, you are teaching us who they are, and it is for that that you are our Fenimore Cooper. So I think that okay. should be borne in mind. Uh, it was not simply a tale, it was also a, a real account by someone with an ethnologist's eye right. of uh, an extraordinary culture which still remained. Some years after I saw this film, I was in Moscow for a series of screenings that were given me for my research, and I saw a remarkable documentary film called Forest, People of the Forest. Okay. And in that film, one sees the people of the forest uh, who are now performing dances for tourists. They're not, right. you know, they've become an object of tourism, and they've become also an object of governmental concern. And they go to Arsenyev in Vladivostok, who is still alive, working, to ask him to represent them because they knew of right. his friendship for the people of the forest. Um, that was a kind of thrilling thing to see, actually, this shift from this very, very artful, um, very, very beautiful, very, very splendid spectacle involving Arsenyev to this uh, very simple kind of documentary evidence of, the, of his work. Okay. Um, no. Well, well uh, I was just going to say that I think also, I'm gonna, you know, add into refuting the charge that I brought up. But it's it's something you know I, I should even be more specific that that is distinguished a scholar as Donald Ritchie, who many people will go to uh, because of his book on on um, Kurosawa, thinks of this as a lesser. Kurosawa film. That's why I'm bringing this up because I think it's a misimpression uh, in any number of ways, a misreading uh, of the film. Uh, the thing I would add uh, is that uh, we really do have, when you look carefully at the film, uh, but to look carefully it doesn't take that much effort because of what you've already pointed out, the extraordinary clarity of uh, Kurosawa's style, the way he combines clarity and surprise. Um, in his style, that uh, one should not mistake clarity for simplicity, for a first, first area. And second, we really do get very close to uh, the skills that Dersuer has and the degree to which he represents uh, access to a whole other mode of life. Well, I think there is, by the way, something to be said in response to that and also somewhat further in the direction of refutation okay. of the argument of simplicity. If you look at this film attentively, and it's hard not to right. once you start, um, what you will see deployed throughout the film are uh, the elements that compose this universe, air, earth, fire, and water. And they're all presented through the medium of Dersu's um, uh, kind of reading right. of the forest, for he reads it as a text. Absolutely the case. And this is the, uh, probably the central axis of the film. That is to say, what he does 
is to uh, be able to predict not only that there's going to be a storm, but at what time it will come, what kind it will be, uh, according to the reactions of the creatures in the forest. Uh, he reads footprints to tell them that not only has someone passed, but what age that person is, an old man who walks on his heels, for young men walk on their toes. He reads all kinds of signs, and he leaves all kinds of signs of his own passage for others to read. Uh, uh, so that these signs are read largely in the earth, but they're also read in the sky. And the two elements of fire and water right. are used in dramatic contrast uh, in this film, in um, sequences which are sequences of danger. Absolutely. And if I can just add one thing uh, uh, to that, following your argument, it's also um, uh, a cognitively highly combined set of reading skills he has. That is, he uses all of his cognitive capacities, whether that be, and it's even thematicized, sight, sound, and smell are all combined in his capacities as a reader or interpreter of the forest, the place, as uh, as the text. So it's not just one capacity. I mean, clearly he, he has an extraordinary intellect by the standards of his own culture. Uh, even for uh, Arsenia, by our standards, because there is, of course, this brilliant and marvelously filmed episode of their being lost uh, during the storm. Yes. And the surprise, one of the surprises is the, is the finding on the day after when things have calmed down um, and through the drawings in the captain's notebook of the way, the extraordinarily intelligent way in which uh, Dessou had saved both their lives. It's, a, it's an amazing kind of sequence of, of events and uh, it's very central to uh, the captain's and our own appraisal right. of Dessou, who is by no means a simple, sweet old man, <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> but a reader of texts and of first-rate intelligence. Well, actually, that takes us a little bit further down the path of, of one of the arguments in uh, what you might call progressive uh, anthropology, refuting earlier things about so-called primitivism. And as, as you know very well, one of those arguments has to do with the capacities of certain societies as those people who are bricoleurs. That is, they take all the elements available to them and they combine them in extraordinary um, ways. And uh, that is where you see the value not only of the survival of cultures, but of the um, of the creativity and the intellect of these uh, of these cultures, and in that sense, um, Derso is a brilliant bricoleur who is capable of this creative act, not only of saving their lives, but it turns out creating something of just extraordinary ingenuity and beauty. Because we're um, amazed at this structure that is revealed to us through and this comes back to another one of your points, Annette, through the ellipsis in editing. Because when the Arsenyev collapses, we go to the black and we come back, and all of a sudden he's inside, and he's collapsed completely outside. I mean, presumably with, with imminent danger of death from all of the elements, and now all of a sudden we're in a cozy home. And the editing, of course, reveals this, and we see the um, um, uh, tripod, that's served as the center poles yeah. of the architecture. Really uh, marvelous stuff. And I must say that that particular sequence that's frequently discussed about the film, justly, justly so, is one of those sequences, I think, in the modern canon of storytelling that uh, you know rivals things like another canonical work from another medium, something like Faulkner's The Bear, about these encounters between people who know modernity but wish to know other ways of life before the imminent uh, disappearance of those ways, uh, those ways of life. Yes, and uh, of course, what happened, as I said at the beginning of our talk, is that the people of that region and other regions in the Soviet Union um, for Arsenyev lived into 
and well beyond the creation of the Soviet Union, began to feel themselves uh, threatened and began to feel their cultures kind of dissipating under their eyes. And of course, um, we're presented with an extreme example of that at the end of the right. film when um, our hunter, Desu Sala, uh, loses his eyesight, can no longer hunt, and is brought back to Khabarovsk. Um, it's a very tragic end for him, for he has forgotten how to sleep in a house. Right. He cannot hunt in the city, and he can't even sleep outdoors in the city. Right. Um, well, th that um, let me bring up a, a point about the film's style and those uh, yeah. sequences uh, as well, because you've explicated so well what narratively happens there. And one of the things that happens visually is that while you know this is a recreation of a house in that region, the Kurosawa was shooting on location much of uh, of this film. Is a couple of critics have said, well, you know. Gee, it seems much more two-dimensional when you're in there and not doesn't have the volume and the architectural sense of space. And, to, and that's offered as a criticism of the film. I would counter thrust with that's exactly the, 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 the point that not that this is uncomfortable in any way, but rather from the point of view of Dersu, just being inside a place like this, it seems to collapse the dimensionality of, his, of I, his life. I absolutely agree with you. That has always struck me when I looked at the film. That is to say that the rendering of the inside of the house is, I think, on purpose constricting. Yes. And, um, and we feel that when we see it. And it's not, I think, to be used in criticism or disparagingly. Uh, against the film. I think that it it really helps us as spectators to to feel the confines as they must have felt to this extraordinary creature. Absolutely. Now one of the other things about this uh, 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 film is despite the, the, the clarity of all the image and in the way I think you, you were also suggesting earlier, the way in which particularly in the outdoor sequences we're simply drawn into the experience and mm -hmm. part of that has to do with the extraordinary um, cinematography of depth in the forest. So we get this sense of how vast the place is but also of the volumes and textures of all of the uh, all of the all of the spaces um, as well, but you know, in addition to that, while we're in the in the forest, we just have this um, sense of the. Uh, I mean, it's so simple, but I know few films that give us this sense of the vast and the awe-inspiring of genuinely this relationship between nature and and man. And again, not sentimentalized. Uh, we see all of nature in its. Uh, in its in its complexity, but with these extraordinary long shots, one of the strategies he has is frequently long shots with close miking, so that we hear the conversation. We're we're orally close hmm. to the characters, yet at the same time, the their place within nature is preserved uh, visually. I would want to say that that relation of man to nature is indeed uh, inscribed partly by the soundtrack and the recording of birds and of the movement of creatures, and the crackle Absolutely. of um, logs and uh, twigs and all other kinds of noises, the, you know, the rustling of streams. And every once in a while it seemed to me that one could hear in the soundtrack the sound of, of the wooden blocks that the Japanese use in uh, their um, kabuki and, uh, and other orchestras, which is a very special sound. Um, and it's, it, it sometimes sounds almost like a bird of some sort. It seemed to me that they were, they were, they were using the blocks. Okay. Well, that also uh, brings us up to the way in which much of the commentary in this film about all relationships is not something that's verbalized through dialogue. That is to, to, to take uh, in some 
films, not, not the films we tend to admire most, uh, think of, th that the dialogue in somehow summarizes everything that's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's going on. Whereas in this film, um, the dialogue between Arsenyev and Dersu is always interesting. But that's not the essence of the experience, nor is it the essence of their friendship. It's Arsenyev. Well, partly, I think. Okay. Because from time to time, when Dessou speaks, what he says is either very new, very somewhat strange to the captain, or it poses a problem of some kind. Right. And his reaction in both cases, the reaction of the captain, is one of tact and of reflection, so that he will sometimes observe a silence, or, for example, toward the end, um, when uh, Desu begs to go back to the forest, he simply leaves without saying anything and then returns with the rifle that he That's presents right. to him. So that the cap the, the, their friendship is made of reflective and comprehending silences as well as of dialogue. No, I think that that's, that's precisely the point, that, that there is a rhythm that includes these silences that is also part of, uh, the, it's linked to the pacing of the film, Man in Relationship to Nature, which gives the film one pacing, but also Arsenyev's attempts to understand and to admire uh, Dersu are another part mm -hmm. of that rhythm as, uh, as well. I think of one shot where, it's one of the shots where the men are all at the fire and Arsenyev is with Dersu. The men aren't really paying attention to him and they're being very gregarious with one another and you can see Arsenyev knowing this is a moment in which he should learn from this, yes. uh, from this man. Yes. Well, you know, we're, um, we're, we're just about out of time so I want to give you uh, the last word uh, here on just a couple of things that you would just want people to remember about what they should admire about this film. Well, I think most of the things that I've already said, one being the fact that this is a beautiful film by a master of, of cinematic style, form, and technique. The second, that it is the great celebration of the Russian landscape, and one can compare it perhaps only with certain written texts by Tolstoy, for example. Right. And thirdly, that it is uh, based, of course, on the experience of someone traveling in that country, exploring that country at the turn of the century with a keen ethnographer's I, and who has much to tell us about a foreign Great. culture. Great. I'm sorry I have to cut you off because okay. we've just run out of time. If you'd like more information about this series, please drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinema Tech, City University Television, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Let's see if I can say that again even more rapidly. City Cinema Tech, City University Television, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. One six. Annette, I always hate to rush when I have to thank someone like you, but uh, we look forward to having you back on City Cinema Tech. I, this was a pleasure. Great. Always a pleasure to have you. And I hope you find it pleasurable to tune into City Cinema Tech as we travel through the archives of film history to try to bring you the best of this marvelous medium. Thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm.